Eternal rest give unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we pray for the poor, poor souls in purgatory. They're poor because they have no way to pay their debts and depend on us who are still in the body and able to merit. There is no merit in purgatory. They can't pay their debts. All that suffering, which is incredibly intense, the flames in purgatory, the saints tell us, is the same as that in hell. And there's no increase in charity in all that suffering. No merit. So it's better to suffer now and make account. The more we suffer now in love of God, for the love of God, for the salvation of souls, the bigger our vessels get, the bigger they become, and the more they can receive when they go to heaven. Or the higher they are in heaven. However you want to think about it. Now, Holy Mother Church is wonderfully clear on the reality of purgatory. It's amazing to find so many today who deny the existence of purgatory. Now, listen to the 25th session of the Council of Trent, year 1563. The Catholic Church, instructed by the Holy Ghost, in conformity with the sacred scriptures and the ancient tradition of the Fathers and sacred councils, and very recently in this ecumenical council, has taught that there is a purgatory. It's de fide. If we deny a purgatory, we're no longer Catholic. We're Protestant. We're protesting. It's de fide. Any Catholic who denies purgatory is not Catholic. The council goes on and says that the souls detained there are assisted by the suffrages of the faithful and especially by the acceptable sacrifice of the altar. Underline those last words. Especially by the acceptable sacrifice of the altar. Thank you, Holy Mother Church, Council of Trent. The Holy Mass, the Holy Mass has windows that are opened at the consecration and expose our time and place to the graces flowing from Calvary and expose it to heaven. It's the beauty of the Mass. And the windows close when the priest consumes the chalice. Our Lord said, When I am lifted up, I will draw all things to Myself. Time and eternity, time and eternity are reconciled at the elevation. So also are the living and the dead reconciled. And this is why we must pray for them after the consecration. See, at the Mass, at the canon, we pray for the souls in purgatory after the consecration because it's opened up to them too. Thus, we can also see how the Holy Mass, the awesome thing that God has entrusted to us, the lowliest men, the most awesome thing He has entrusted to us, also makes Calvary present to the poor souls in purgatory, giving them relief Thus, many altar pieces and works of art represent this mysterious truth. It's in the Roman Missal, the Missali Romanum. There's a picture in there that shows this. When Mass uh, this morning, it was there. Now, consider one story as a sign of this truth. Don Bernardino de Mendoza offered St. Teresa of Jesus an excellent house for a new Carmelite foundation in Valladolid. I'm sure you're not surprised that I'm talking about St. Teresa. Well, he offered her this new house. He wanted her to make a foundation. But before she could make this foundation, a new Carmel, circumstances were such that she had to make the Malagon foundation first. But as she was completing this foundation, Don Bernardino suddenly died and this happened not long after he had recovered from a rather frivolous existence. He went to confession. He wanted to make reparation. He offered St. Teresa foundation as an alms to pay for his sinfulness, pay his debts. Well, part of his recovery, of course, involved this foundation then. St. Teresa would have stayed 
some time longer in Malagon, but our Lord called her to order. He let her know that she was leaving a soul to linger, suffering in purgatory. So she set off with all possible speed, even though nothing was ready for the new foundation. Our Lord urged her on, this soul is suffering greatly. He indicated that Don Bernardino would not go to heaven until the first day that Mass was offered at the new house, the new Carmel. The authorization was slow in coming. St. Teresa decided to do without it and hastened to have a Mass said, not expecting, however, that the promise of heavenly glory for Don Bernardino would be fulfilled before the day of the official foundation. Doubtless, our Lord intended to do without official authorizations and at communion of the faithful. Now note the time during the Mass. It's very important. After the priest has completed the oblation or the Holocaust by consuming the host under both kinds, at that moment, the windows closed, the graces have been offered, it's all complete behind the priest Saint Teresa of Jesus, he was holding the host, giving out communion. Saint Teresa of Jesus, uh, pod, it was Padre Julian uh, de Avila, he was holding the sacred host. Behind him, Saint Teresa saw Don Bernardino, his face resplendent with joy. He thanked her for what she had done to release him from purgatory and went up to heaven. And Saint Teresa went into an ecstasy that caught her up into heaven with him. Oh, what a wonderful thing it is to get a soul out of purgatory. What a wonderful thing it is to get a soul out of purgatory. Let's continue to pray for the dead, especially at the Mass, and by having Masses offered for the poor souls. During the next eight days, if we visit a cemetery and offer prayers for the dead, we can earn a plenary indulgence for them with all the normal stipulations Prayers for the Holy Father, detachment from sin, confession and communion within eight days. Again, 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 oh, what a wonderful thing it is to help the poor souls attain to their place in heaven. Eternal rest give unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, today is Election Day. First, I want to speak about that just briefly. Whatever happens, let's keep firmly in mind that, one, God has permitted it. Nothing can happen in this world without His permission. Or... Nothing can happen in this world without His directly willing it. Thus, the saints always viewed all things, even the most distasteful, as coming from the hand of God for their own good. So one of the psalm verses reads, You humbled me, O God, that I might learn your law. And so if we're humbled, it's so that we will learn God's law anew. Second of all, we are wayfarers here. We're pilgrims. So we say, this too shall pass. No matter what happens, we say to ourselves, this too shall, shall pass. And I too shall pass from this life. Let's not get so carried away that we get depressed and lose our peace over something that is passing. The church has existed under every kind of extreme situation, every sort of government or that lack thereof. She's always passed through it, and she will pass through this too. Third of all, our idea of victory or loss may not be the correct one. We do not know what the future holds. The person we think may be the best may be the worst. The king we do know will return someday. Thank God. He will return and his church will triumph. So I encourage you, don't lose your peace, whatever happens. 
Now, during the octave of all saints, Holy Mother Church encourages the daily mass of the dead. Is what we're saying today, tomorrow, and the next day. The church wants to increase the number of her saints in heaven, so she no sooner than celebrates all saints, and she says, get those souls out of purgatory. Work on it. So the octave of all saints is all about the poor souls. Isn't that interesting? So these next few days, we'll try to give you a few thoughts on purgatory. Now, today's will be the longest of all the sermons. Purgatory. Sometimes I like to say it, purgatory. Going to purge out all those sins. But sadly today, let's face it, from the behavior and speech of many Catholics, one would think that we no longer have to believe in purgatory, right? Some think it is just an idea that goes back to the Middle Ages. Someone back there thought it up in those hard, dark times. When in fact, they were probably some of the best times the world has ever seen. Some think it is just an idea then, just made up. So today, everyone seems to go straight to heaven. Cardinal Ratzinger in the Ratzinger Report once said, The fact is that all of us today think we are so good that we deserve nothing less than heaven. Why is this now? One of the reasons is is because we're living in a time in which everybody thinks they're a victim. I'm a victim. All the bad things that have happened to me in my life, that's not my fault. It's because of my upbringing. It was because of this. It was because of that. We're victims, so we don't deserve any punishment. Even these kinds of thoughts, they need to be purged. That's why there's a purgatory. Because they're wrong. I know a priest, a good priest, God rest his soul, who had arranged many masses to be said for himself after death, including no less than two Gregorian masses. Why? Because he knew the climate of the church today, that hardly anyone would be praying for him when he died. Planned ahead. He knew he would need them where he was going. Now, maybe he got a little carried away, but on the same token, the thought is that no one's praying for the souls in purgatory. You know, I feel sorry for the nuns who die, especially in in some of these convents that are pretty holy, are striving for holiness. Everybody thinks they go to heaven, and no one prays for a nun that dies. Poor things, they're probably all in purgatory. St. Teresa said of all the nuns she knew, only two Went to, pur- went to heaven. All of them went to purgatory that she knew of. And they were holier back then than they are now. Well, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So faith and reason tell us that there's a middle ground of expiation where the soul is cleansed from all stain of sin before entering into the glory of heaven. Purgatory is then both scriptural and traditional and reasonable. Let's look at our faith. Let's concentrate there. Scriptural, we know that we could talk about that for some time. It's the penny that must be paid, the last penny, the last farthing. It won't be let it out of the prison. St. Paul talks about a purifying fire. But let's talk about the f- tradition. Council of Florence, Council of Lyon, and most especially the Council of Trent have said in clear language, there is a purgatory. And it's based upon Scripture and the Fathers. Listen to the Council of Trent. This is the 25th session. I don't know about you, but when I hear these statements, it's just like, it's like playing on a harp in my soul. It's just beautiful. Like it's, I could read it over and over again. It's like, ah, oh, so nice. I don't have to rely on my own judgment. I can rely on God. He tells me what is true with assurance through his holy church. Are we thankful for this? Thank you, God. I don't have to beat my head against the wall trying to figure things out. Here's what he says through his holy church. The Catholic church instructed by the Holy Ghost in conformity with the sacred scriptures and the ancient tradition of the fathers and sacred councils and very recently in this ecumenical council has taught that there is a purgatory. 
there is a purgatory. And that the souls detained there assisted by are assisted by the suffrages of the faithful and especially by the acceptable sacrifice of the altar. Let's look at some of the fathers they're speaking of. St. Cyprian. He was around the year 200 AD, so he's a pretty early father. Here's what he says. It is one thing to receive the reward of heaven immediately and quite another thing to be thrown into the prison and not come out until the last farthing has been paid. It is one thing to have done away with all sin here on earth by our martyrdom and quite another to be purified of our sins in the hereafter by a lengthy time of suffering. Now, he didn't use the word purgatory, but he's talking about it. Lengthy time of suffering. Now, I want you to know something. When you go to purgatory, you get no merit for that. You don't increase your charity. You don't increase your place in heaven. All that suffering there does not bring glory to God. But all your suffering here does. All your suffering here increases the size of your vessel. You can receive more of God when you die if you do it for the love of Him. Let's make it count. Let's make it count. Let's listen to St. Gregory the Great. He says, Each one will be presented to the judge exactly as he was when he departed this life. Yet there must be a cleansing fire before judgment because of faults that may remain to be purged away. St. Gregory. St. Augustine. That cleansing fire is thought, of, thought lightly of. Yet the fire be more grievous, that fire be more grievous than anything that man can suffer in this life whatsoever. So clearly, from this discussion, it follows that there truly is a purgatory. Thank God. Thank you, Lord. We need it. Because if there weren't there, only a small fraction of mankind would be saved. Only those that would go straight to heaven. Because the justice of God would be so terrible. It is too terrible. Such that few would make it to heaven. If there were no middle state, even those with slight imperfections would have to be rejected. And many canonized saints have tried to have others pray for them because they said, look, I'm going to purgatory. Padre Pio said he was going to purgatory. After 50 years of the stigmata, he considered that I was going to purgatory. St. Teresa of Jesus, the great Carmelite mystic, I'm going to purgatory, pray for me. None of the saints thought they were going straight to heaven. How many of us think we're always going straight to heaven? So let us do all we can to avoid this place. We do not have to go there. And I want to repeat again how much our sufferings count here on earth. They count. Let's make them count. The more we suffer for the love of God, the bigger our vessel becomes. The more our faults are purged away, the higher our place in heaven. St. Teresa of Jesus, great Carmelite mystic, said she would suffer unto the end of the world, even through our times. Can you imagine that? And she knew what she was saying. She saw our times. She said she would suffer until the end of the world to gain one degree of glory in heaven. So wonderful is that one degree. Something to think about. We are still in our bodies. We can gain a degree of glory by embracing the daily duties of our life and suffering what God deems to send us and even taking up extra. Let us avoid the fire by burning all the fuel in our souls now while we're in this life. And so when, when we die, there'll be nothing to burn and we'll be on fire for love of God. Become a saint. God wants it. The church wants it. And you will want it. St. Ephraim says, I beseech you, my dear brethren, 
and friends, in the name of God who commands me to leave you, to remember me when you assemble to pray, do not bury me with perfumes, give them, give them not to me but to God. Me, conceived in sorrows, bury with lamentations, but instead of perfumes, assist me with your prayers. For the dead are benefited by the prayers of the living saints. Let us continue to pray for the faithful departed, especially at the Holy Mass, and having Masses offered for them. During the next few days, until November 8th, if we visit a cemetery and offer prayers for the dead, even mentally, we can earn a plenary indulgence for the poor souls with all the normal stipulations. Prayers for the Holy Father, detachment from sin, confession, and communion within eight days. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. And may their souls and all the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Today we continue our little discussion on purgatory. Talk about things divine and things holy, things of the faith. Consider this scene from the life of St. Faustina. Once I was summoned to the judgment seat of God. I stood alone before the Lord. Jesus appeared such as we know him during his passion. After a moment, his wounds disappeared except for five. Those in his hands, his feet, and his side. Suddenly, I saw the complete condition of my soul as God sees it. I could clearly see all that is displeasing to God. I did not know that even the smallest transgressions will have to be accounted for. Even the smallest transgressions will have to be accounted for. What a moment! Who can describe it? To stand before the thrice holy God. Jesus asked me, Who are you? I answered, I am your servant, Lord. He said, You are guilty of one day of fire in purgatory. I wanted to throw myself immediately into the flames of purgatory, but Jesus stopped me and said, Which do you prefer? Suffer one day in purgatory or for a short while on earth? And her reply is one that every saint makes. Jesus, I want to suffer in purgatory, and I want to suffer all the greatest pains on earth, even if it were to the end of the world. When you see the beauty and the goodness and the wonder of God, you would say the same. When we're confronted with the immensity of God, we will think likewise. We will understand the malice of sin, even the smallest sin, and long to do anything, anything, even suffer through the most tormenting times until the end of the world, times like our own. Clearly, we do a great disservice to the dead when we say that they are no longer suffering. How many times people do that after a funeral? Oh, they're no longer suffering. Now, yeah, yeah, that's true. They're no longer suffering in the body. It doesn't mean they're not suffering in their souls. Pains of purification and purgatory. So let us refrain from all such speech and making claims that someone is in heaven. Instead, let us encourage each other to have masses said for them and offer prayers for them. This is why the church wants us to have masses and indulgences. But consider just a line from even the, the Dies Irae, which we said today. That's the sequence. Lo, the book exactly worded, wherein all have been recorded. Thence shall judgment be awarded. When the judge his seat attaineth, and each hidden deed arraigneth, nothing unavenged remaineth. What did St. Faustina say? Even the smallest transgression, even the smallest transgression, 
will have to be accounted for. It kind of puts a whole new light on people passing away. Oh, they're in heaven. Oh, is that right? Shame on us for thinking like that and behaving like that. Okay. Why does the church want us to offer not only indulgences, but masses, to have masses said for the deceased? Why does the church want us to make sacrifices and, and, and do various things, not just for indulgences' sake, but to pray for the dead? Well, in order to understand why this is the case, we must understand first that sin causes at least three things to happen. We incur guilt. Guilt just means I'm responsible for this sin. And I, I can't get away from that responsibility. Then there's a debt of punishment. And then there's stain of sin. Guilt, debt, stain. These are the three main effects of sin. Now the last two, we can think of in terms of external and internal damages caused by sin. Each time a person sins... He causes chaos and damage in the world. That's the debt of punishment. But he also causes chaos in his soul. That's stain. Stain of sin. So in order to arrive, let's go through these three things now. In order to arrive at the church suffering, which is purgatory, we must be clean and clear of all sin. We can't have any guilt of sin in our souls. We can't be responsible for any sin. So, if it's a mortal sin we have in our soul, that must be removed before we die. Through some sort of conversion. Baptism, if we're not baptized. Making a good uh, confession. If there's no priest, no, we have to make a perfect act of contrition. With the help of God's grace. We should never count on that. It may not happen. You cannot make an act of contrition without God's grace aiding you. It's impossible. It's a pure gift of God. Also, with extreme unction, if someone is beyond uh, cognizance and unable to make a response to the priest, if they're truly sorry for their sins, through the application of the Extreme unction, the sacrament of extreme unction, anointing, they can be forgiven their mortal sins. Now, if the sin is venial, they can have the responsibility, the guilt, removed by an act of love, by prayer. So, our Lord must take the guilt from our souls. He takes responsibility for them through the sacraments, primarily, But there remains the other two things, the debt of punishment and the stain. Now, the more devoted we are in confession, the more sorry we are, the more those can be alleviated too. If we had perfect, perfect sorrow, truly we're deeply sorry and grieved for our sins, which means we would never commit them again. We'd rather die than commit them again then it's, it can be alleviated very quickly through the sacrament of confession. Maybe all of it will be removed. But that's very hard to do. This is why people coming out of confession are not perfect. They still have some work to do. Got some damages to undo, internal and external. Now, as for atoning for these internal and external, let's make an analogy here. Let's think about a young boy... And his friend, and they have their slingshot, and they're shooting some rocks and having a fun time. But this one of the boys likes to hear the sound of breaking glass. And the next door neighbors have this beautiful house and a picture window there in range of his slingshot. And his friends daring him to. I dare you. You can't hit that window. And so the boy says, Oh, yeah, I can do it. Besides, I like the sound of breaking glass. And so he puts a rock through the window and it breaks. Okay. There's three things that happen now. He's responsible for the broken window. There's a broken window and he's got this problem inside of him about hearing breaking glass. 
about trying to show his friend that I'm better than you are and I'm tough. Come on, look what I can do. Well, the first thing he needs to do is go over to his neighbors and kneel down and say, I'm sorry, and he better be sorry. And so he's sorry, and his neighbors, good friends, they say, we forgive you. And so the guilt is removed. But there's still a broken window, right? Now, he's a young boy. He can't pay for it. He doesn't have any money. He's poor. So his dad comes home, sees everything, sees that his son is contrite, see that he's made up to his neighbors. Maybe he helped him. He says, okay, I'll pay for it. Get this solved. And he pulls out a big wad of bills and he pays for the window. Okay, that's the external punishment due to sin, the external damage. That's been paid for. The window's now been paid and replaced. There's still this problem of the boy. Now notice this remuneration for the window This can be paid by anybody. It can be paid by his father, by the neighbors themselves. It can be paid by anybody. It's not necessarily has to come from the boy. But if this boy is going to amend his ways and not keep breaking windows, he must change his disposition, his internal disposition. This changing of his disposition or inclination to break windows is like the punishment due to the internal damages caused by sin. Only the boy can undo this. Dad can't do it for him. But he has to practice saying no to himself, no to his vice, and practice the opposite virtue. And after the good, uh, you can think of the good thief, after he repented on the cross, He said, we deserve this for our sins. He was making up for all his past sins. He was undoing the stain in his soul. That's a biblical example of this this idea. So we see here that this is precisely what goes on in purgatory and why it's called the church suffering. The holy souls that undergo suffering both for the external and the internal damages due to sin. They not only suffer for damages they have caused to others, but are purified of all evil tendencies and impurities within themselves. As members of the church, we can help them. That we can actually help the poor souls is a doctrine of our faith. We talked about it yesterday. We know that from the various councils like Lyon, Florence, and Trent. We also know it from the Bible in the book of Second Maccabees. Now, we can help them in at least two ways. There's no opportunity to acquire merit after death. They can't pay for their external punishment, so we can do that for them. That's what we can do. We can earn indulgences. That's why they're called the poor souls. They have no money to pay their debts. So just as the parents can make amends for their boy by paying for the neighbor's broken window, so too we in the church militant militant, can pay the debt of punishment due to the sins of those in purgatory. We can only pay for the external damages, though. The external punishment, not the internal. This is what we're doing by gaining indulgences for them. So a plenary indulgence covers all the external debt of sin for one person. A partial, only a partial of that debt. So if I earn a plenary indulgence for somebody, that's not an immediate go to heaven card. He's got internal problems still he's got to work on. It's not magic. Sometimes I think people look at it a little bit magically. Oh, I got a plenary indulgence. I got everybody out of purgatory. Uh, uh, Maybe, you know, I don't know. As for the internal damage, the boy himself is the only one who can change this disposition, but we can assist him. How? Have masses said for him. That's why we have the mass said for the souls. So that it can be exposed, that that soul can be exposed to Jesus on Calvary and receive that help he needs in overcoming the internal problems in his soul in wiping clear the stain. This is why St. Gregory the Great had 30 masses prayed in a row for a poor soul who died. So once the indulgences take away the external punishment due to sin and the fires of purgatory burn away the imperfections of a soul, there's nothing to keep that pure soul from heaven. 
When there is no more fuel for a fire, it goes out. The soul once purified rises happily to heaven. Let us avoid this fire by burning all the fuel while we're still living in this world. And the Lord's giving us plenty of opportunity to do just that. I'd like to end with a little story from St. Alphonsus. He reports that a saint was told of how an angel proposed to a sick man the choice of remaining three days in purgatory or of being confined for two years to his bed by the infirmity under which he labored. The sick man chose the three days in purgatory. But he was scarcely an hour there when he began to complain to the angel that his purgatory, instead of being for three days, had lasted for several years. What? replied the angel. Your body is still warm on the bed of death, and you speak of years. Let us avoid this fire. St. John Chrysostom says, If you do not wish to be punished, be your own judge. Chastise and amend yourself. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Yesterday, in our discussion, in our meditation on purgatory, we learned that if we are to avoid purgatory, We have to overcome the stain of sin in our souls. Stain is one of the effects of sin. This is the same as saying we have to set right our interior life. When our interior life is is, is set right and ordered, the stain is, is decreased and ultimately removed. And the stain is most notably in our will and in our passions So we have to put our will aright. Sin is in the will. It's the most damaged part of man. Recall from the gospel, the dishonest steward. He was so willful, so set in his ways that he could not easily repent even when he was discovered. Rather, he set about using his craftiness and dishonesty to gain friends. This sort of willfulness can only be corrected by the steward himself, since it is in his soul. His will is what needs correcting. And only God can penetrate this deep into a creature's soul. We can't do that. How we would like to, and we'd make a mess of things if we did. Well, indulgences, they can't reach in that deep. They can just pay the external debts of sin, see. They can't get in there and and, and work on the interior life. This is why the church has us not only earning indulgences for the poor souls to pay their debts, their external debts due to the uh, disorder they've caused in the world, but also to pay their internal debts debt, clean the stain. We need something else. What do we need? We need the mass. We need prayers and almsgiving that God will grant their grace, that God would go in there with his love and justice and clean house. This is why in the mass, the memento for the dead is after the consecration. We want this particular soul or all the souls in purgatory to be exposed to God more deeply to purify that stain. Keep this in mind. We read St. John of the Cross in his Dark Night of the Soul. He says, the fires of purgatory would have no power over them, the souls, even though they came into contact with it if they had no imperfections for which to suffer. These are the material upon which the fires of purgatory seizes, When the material is consumed, there is naught else that can burn. So a saint from heaven can go down into purgatory. wouldn't affect him one bit because there's nothing to burn. It's another interesting note of St. John of the Cross. He says, it is easier for God to create our souls from nothing than to purify them. Wow. 
Wow. Put your mind around that one. It is easier for God to create our souls from nothing than it is for him to purify them. What does that say about purgatory? It's not an easy place. Well, today, let's look more into purgatory with the help of the 16th century St. Catherine of Genoa, drawing upon her work of purgation and purgatory. Now, you ever wonder what the souls in purgatory are thinking down there? What's their focus? Well, she describes how the poor souls are completely focused on God and his will, uniting their will to his. They don't think about things like, that person there is leading before me, or I'll lead before that other one over there. They don't think like that. When souls are separated from their body and death, their wills are fixed in whichever direction they are turned at death. If they're turned toward the good, they go to, they are fixed toward God and toward heaven. If they're fixed or turned toward the bad, then they're fixed toward hell and toward the, the bad, toward hell. They can no longer make choices. Here's how St. Catherine puts it in for the poor souls. The soul, for its part, no longer has a choice of its own. It can seek only what God wills, nor would it want it otherwise. And if the living were to offer alms for the benefit of the poor souls in purgatory, to shorten the assigned time for their purgation, still those souls could not turn with affection to watch, but would leave all things to God who is paid as he wishes. If those souls could, in gratitude, turn their attention, that would be self-seeking, and that would distract them from the contemplation of the divine will, and that distraction would in itself be hell. Wow, that's amazing. So let's do our purgatory now, not comparing ourselves with others, no jealousy, but rather seeking only the will of God. Such behavior is a foretaste of heaven. This is why learning about purgatory is so important. This life can be our purgatory if we want it to be. So what they're doing now, let's start. What they're doing down in purgatory, let's start doing now on this, on this earth, in our bodies. Let's not be comparing ourselves to others. Let's compare ourselves to Jesus and Mary and his saints. But when we seek self, it is a foretaste of hell. A divided heart is a tormented heart. Now, the main focus of the poor souls, then, is the will of God. They know that their will is not fully in accord with God due to their sins. And they want this remedied. And until it is remedied, it's like hell for them. This helps us see why the saints all describe the pains of purgatory as being the same as the fires of hell, but without any despair. In other words, the pain of senses, the pain of the senses is the same. In fact, purgatory is always described by them as being below ground, as some sort of chamber, outside chamber of hell. You have hell, then you got between the earth or the outer surface and hell, you have purgatory. Something like that. God will show us. Well, St. Catherine, she explains that the ardor in this purgatory is in transforming the will completely into God. This is to be purgatory there, but it's meant to be our purgatory here. Thus, those who make it furthest along the way in this life enter into the unit of life. They've done their purgatory. Their, their, Their wills are in union with God. But even they, at times, have to go down to purgatory. Okay. Let's go on to another point here. For the poor souls, it is not the suffering that is the most painful thing in purgatory, but rather that something in them is abhorred by love itself. This causes them great consternation. St. Catherine says, Such impediments are the cause of suffering of the poor souls in purgatory. Not that those souls dwell on their sufferings. They dwell rather on the resistance they feel in themselves against the will of God. That's a good way of putting it. They realize there's something in them that's resisting God and they don't like that. It's painful. 
That's what's burning. Do we feel this way about our faults? Our self-love, our self-indulgence? Do we look upon them as, this is resisting God, this is hurting God. Does it cause us pain? Are we wanting to do our purgatory now? Then we start, we have to start thinking in those ways. That's to enter more deeply into the spiritual life. St. Catherine points out over and over that the souls there feel great joy in one thing, that they are now doing the will of God. She says, what he wills for them is what gives them joy. So do we seek and love the will of God? Here's the way to do that. Every day, wake up and say, Lord, help me love you more today. Number one. Number two. Lord, help me love my cross. Help me love my cross. For it is your will that I carry this cross. Another interesting point of St. Catherine's is they, she says, they cannot remember the good and evil in their past, nor that of others. This is really good, okay? This is very good for us to hear this. They cannot remember the good and evil in their past, nor that of others. They will not say, I wish I had never committed such sins, for now I would be in paradise. They are not distracted by these sorts of things. They are not upset or resentful. Wow, what a great lesson for us here on earth. They don't cling to bad memories or to resentments. Heaven is already at work in them, wiping away the tears of the past. The fires of purgatory purge their memory, file by file, memory by memory. You want to shorten your purgatory? Don't add in a bunch of impure memories, a bunch of impure images. And I'm not just talking about things about the Sixth Commandment. I'm talking about anything that's not godly. All those commercials we've seen. All those movies. All that nonsense that's not godly. Has got to go each and every file. So don't be adding in all kinds of stuff. Adding more time to your purgatory. Each selfish thought and action that make their wills cling to themselves have to go. Thus, St. Catherine talks of the rays of God's love that purify but then annihilate. Very much like St. John of the Cross. She says, And I see rays of lightning darting from the divine love to the creature, so intense and fiery as to annihilate not the body alone, but as it were the soul. These rays purify and then annihilate. What are they annihilating? Self-love. All bad images, bad memories, resentments. Now, what if God let them out early? You ever wonder that? Well, maybe God will let this soul out of purgatory ahead of time. Here's what she says. Were a soul to appear in the presence of God with one hour of purgation still due, that would be to do it great harm. It would then suffer more than if it were cast into ten purgatories, for it could not endure the justice and the pure goodness of God, nor would it be fitting on the part of God. That soul, aware that complete satisfaction was not as yet fully rendered to God, even if the time lacking were but a twinkling of an eye, would rather submit to itself to a thousand hells rather than so appear in God's presence. Wow! They would rather submit themselves to a thousand hells than appear so in God's presence. So, there's no magic formulas. No magic formulas. The church has given us many means to help them, offering the Mass, earning indulgences for them, offering prayers like the rosary, the stations, almsgiving, and other good works that are indulged and that also bring graces upon the poor souls from our sacrifices. This is how they're released. Here is the will of God, helping the poor souls in this way. They will certainly help us to avoid this place when they make it to heaven. Now, 
Would that we might start completing our purgatory on earth in earnest. How? By not dwelling on our sufferings, but embracing them. But rather, seeking to conquer any and all resistance to conform our wills to God's. Find out what's resisting God and start doing away with it. By forgetting all past offenses, there's a start. Letting God's rays of love purify us and annihilate our self-love by not looking for some magic formula to holiness. Pray to love your cross. There's the easy way. Pray to love your cross and start taking up more. Embrace the suffering He sends your way as a remedy for our self-love and even adding more to make sure we don't miss the boat then we will do our purgatory, or at least part of it, while on earth. Recall yesterday we spoke of St. Faustina offering herself to suffer both in purgatory and in this earth until the end of time at the request of our Lord. Just for one day in purgatory is all he was asking. She says, I'll do it all. Here's Here's what she wrote after this. He sent her back to earth to suffer for a time, saying, Now rest your head on my bosom and on my heart and draw from its strength and power for these sufferings because you will neither find relief nor help nor comfort anywhere else. Know that you will have much, much to suffer, but don't let this frighten you. I am with you. Let us put our head on the breast of our Lord in the Mass And he will be with us to help us endure our trials and do our purgatory on earth. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, as now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Out of the depths I've cried to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Words taken from today's offertory. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. For two years... I had the great privilege of acting as a priest for a group of cloistered nuns. I remember one particular nun, namely Sister Immaculata, who suffered greatly with cancer of the stomach and died in her mid-forties. During her last few weeks upon earth, Sister Immaculata could hardly eat. This good nun also admitted that she used to complain when she was younger about the smallest pebble in her shoe. With her cancer, she felt as if she had hundreds of small, sharp rocks in her stomach. I remember awaking early on a cold March morning, hearing the bells of the convent tolling announcing the death of Sister Immaculata. She had had all her religious sisters around her and at her deathbed, which happened, for some strange reason, to be facing east. The sisters had opened up the blinds, revealing to all in the room the morning star, the planet Venus, the beautiful image of our Blessed Mother, which introduces the rising sun. Although fortified with those final sacraments, for days and days, Sister Immaculata could hardly move and was in excruciating pain. Yet she quickly arose in bed upon seeing Mary's star and reached out her hand towards the window as if to grab the hand of the risen Christ. She then fell back into bed and began the death rattle. This virgin, with her lamp alight, was ready to meet her bridegroom. I'm reminded of what Melanchthon, the follower of that arch-heretic Martin Luther, once wrote to his dying mother, who was considering leaving the Catholic Church and joining the Lutheran sect before she passed from this world. Melanchthon, in one honest moment, stated to his mother, Dear Mother, True, it is difficult to live as a Roman Catholic, but it is much better to die as one. A funeral mass was then offered for the repose of the soul of Sister Immaculata, with the choir chanting that beautiful introit, that entrance antiphon, Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. Eventually, the body was buried in a special vault, or crypt church beneath the main chapel, awaiting the future resurrection of the body. She wasn't cremated. Rather, she was buried. 
buried in imitation of our blessed Lord, like a seed in the ground that will rise incorruptible. In this modern world of ours, so filled with horrors, connected with the culture of death and grave crimes against the human body, such as embryonic stem cell research, abortion, the barren and infertile sodomitical agenda, direct euthanasia, and assisted suicide, is it any wonder that the bodies of the dead would be treated with such a utilitarian manner as burning them when the bodies of the living are treated with such disdain? In the culture of death, the bodies of the dead are even treated irreverently. And of course, all of us have read stories in the past few decades of cemeteries being the object of vandalism, monuments being turned over, beer and liquor bottles, as well as drug paraphernalia strewn about the cemetery, bonfires, and even in some cases, as I've read of, consecrated graves being unearthed. And if there is a major building project and a cemetery is in the way, our modern, pragmatic, pragmatic, utilitarian society will push to move the bodies and disturb the rest of the dead. Such irreverence for the bodies of the dead was rarely, if ever, seen in the past. At every Holy Mass, at every single representation of the sacrifice of Calvary upon the altar, we pray for the dead. As the Roman canon puts it, Remember those who have died and have gone before us marked with the sign of faith and those who sleep the sleep of peace. The fact that we pray for the dead at every Mass, every day, every hour, and every minute in the church demonstrates our belief in the doctrine of purgatory. You don't pray for the saints in heaven. Rather, you pray to them. And as for the souls in hell, our prayers for them would be absolutely useless for their end is fixed and it cannot be reversed. Lex orandi, lex credendi. A Latin phrase meaning the law of praying is the law of believing. Our prayer shows our faith. Yet despite all the prayers at Mass for the dead, the existence of purgatory has often been denied, completely forgotten, or entirely ignored, at least in practice. And this is very understandable considering that the modern world largely denies the notion of sin. That's what Pius XII said. It's not the fact that the modern world sins, everybody has sinned, but it denies the notion of sin. And so if you deny the notion of sin, so the notion of a place where temporal punishments due to sin are burned away, how could that be acceptable to modern man? My good grandmother suffered for years due to congestive heart failure, causing her to go to the hospital a dozen times in one year. When I visited her and brought her the sacraments, I mentioned the potential atoning power of her sufferings when united with the sufferings of Christ upon the Holy Cross and how she could possibly do her purgatory here on earth. She then looked at me and asked, Purgatory, do we still believe in that? I remember, too, speaking with a Polish priest who was working here in the States. This good priest of God loved America, but he insisted that when he died, his body would be flown back to his homeland and buried in a cemetery in Poland. I remarked that that was wonderful since he wished to be buried near his relatives and parents and friends. But he looked at me with all seriousness and said, that's not the reason. No, I want to be buried in my homeland because there they will pray for my soul, whereas here they largely will not. Again, the principle lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of praying is the law of believing. This applies here. The liturgical landscape in the Latin rite in the West has been devastated over the last 40 years or so with black vestments being replaced by white ones and some liturgical rites, with masses of the resurrection and the presence of a corpse instead of requiems. Many Catholics don't even know what Gregorian masses are. And eulogies and sermons that canonize instead of appealing for prayers to bring comfort to the deceased using sacred scripture 
sacred tradition and also the magisterium or teaching authority of Holy Church, we know that there is solemnly defined two things around this issue. First, purgatory exists. It's dogmatic. It's de fide. To deny it formally would be heresy. The Catechism states, quote, All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation, but after death they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. The church gives the name of purgatory to this final purification of the elect, unquote. In another way, for those who depart this life, neither good enough for heaven nor bad enough for hell, there is a place where any evil is completely purged and the good will be perfectly developed. Hence, we have three provinces in the kingdom of God, which is only the Catholic Church. The church triumphant in heaven, the church militant on earth, and yes, the church suffering in purgatory below. The second defined teaching regarding purgatory is that the residents present in that temporary holding cell can and ought to be prayed for by the living. A good image to keep in mind when thinking of the soul in purgatory is a beggar holding a tin cup and asking for the alms of your prayers. Since any growth in grace or meriting happens only while we are in the body, the souls in the church suffering cannot help themselves, but depend upon us to assist them in paying down their debts. These dear souls were good and faithful soldiers who fought the good fight, but they were wounded in the battle with the remains of forgiven sins and unrepented venial sins. They cry out in their need as they long with an unrelenting thirst for the living waters that are above. We can relieve their pain, their sufferings with our own prayers. We can offer holy masses for the deceased so that drops of the most precious blood may strengthen them. And can even employ that old Irish custom of taking holy water upon entering the church and sprinkling a bit first on the floor so that those waters may somehow cool the flames of those who are in the purgatorial fires below. But the doctrine, the dogma of purgatory is not just the truth of divine revelation, it's also most reasonable. You see, our faith tells us that only the purest of the pure can go to heaven. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. The book of Revelation, of St. John's Revelation, clearly teaches that nothing unclean, nothing defiled can enter into heaven. In short, only unblemished souls, only angels and saints can breathe that clean air of that celestial paradise above. And so if one rejects purgatory then anyone with even the slightest stain, the smallest attachment to created things, would end up in hell. Dying in a state of venial sin or a deathbed conversion after a life of serious sin would be no good. It wouldn't be good enough for salvation if purgatory were somehow eliminated from the equation. Certainly purgatory is about satisfaction. It's about atonement. It's about paying down debts. But purgatory is not about a vengeful and tyrannical God who delights in scourging his creatures. He is not an unjust warden, but he's rather a father who truly seeks to transform his dear children into the full stature of Christ. He wants us to be perfect, to be another Christ. Like a father who might send his child to his room as a punishment so that he can reflect upon his infraction, the good Lord does not enjoy punishing the soul, but rather is saddened as he awaits the child's return. The fires of purgatory may be punishing, but they purify. You punish iron by thrusting it into a furnace and hammering it into shape, but in so doing you make it a very beautiful object. As a final note, there was a commercial that ran in years past for a product called Fram Oil Filters. 
The spokesman was a garage mechanic who owned a series of garages, and he warned car owners who rarely changed their oil or their filter that an individual could pay him now or could pay him later. That is, pay him for an inexpensive filter now or pay a large repair bill later. So it goes with purgatory. You can pay me now or you can pay me later. One could seek to do one's purgatory on earth with prayer, acts of self-denial, penance, and mercy while we live, much more advantageous, much more easy. Or you could do your purgatory after death. It is much more reasonable, advantageous to be fully formed in the church militant versus enduring the pains of purgatory, which according to St. Augustine and every saint of the church, there is a fire there that will be more severe than any pain that can be felt, seen, or imagined in this world. Therefore, always aim high in your spiritual life. Our target to shoot for is not purgatory. You shoot for heaven. We shoot for sainthood. We should be walking towards the pearly gates as opposed to walking towards the emergency room entrance of purgatory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Absolve, O Lord, the souls of all the faithful departed from every bond of sin. Eternal rest give unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. Words from today's gradual and tract. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. God is wonderful in his saints. Through his mystics, he often communicates to us the secrets of time and eternity. In the life of the mystic sister Josefa Menendez, you can read about her in the book, it's called The Way of Divine Love, and she received these mystical touches, visions, vocations back in the 1920s. And in her life, we find that His Majesty put her in touch with many souls in purgatory. They came to solicit her suffrages and sacrifices. At first, she was frightened. Who wouldn't be? By degrees, however, she became accustomed to their confidences. She listened to them, asked them their names, encouraged them, and very humbly recommended herself to their intercession, that is, when they would attain heaven, that they would pray for her. The lessons these holy souls inculcated are worth remembering, and here are a few. Once a nun came to her who on her entrance into heaven confided to Sister Josepha how different the things of earth appear when one passes into eternity. All God counts is the purity of our intention when performing our duties of our state in life, even in the smallest acts. How little is the earth and all it contains, and yet how loved it is. Ah, what comparison is there between life, however prolonged, and eternity? If only it were realized how in purgatory the soul is wearied and consumed with desire to see God face to face. There were also some poor souls who, having escaped through God's mercy from a still greater peril, came to beg Sister Josepha to hasten their deliverance. I am here by God's great mercy, one of them said, for my excessive pride had brought me to the gates of hell. I influenced a great number of other people, and now I would gladly throw myself at the feet of the most abject pauper. Have compassion on me and do acts of humility to make reparation for my pride. Thus, you will be able to deliver me from this abyss. Another confessed, I have spent seven years in mortal sin and three years ill in bed, and I always refused to go to confession. I was ripe for hellfire, 
and would have fallen into it if by your present sufferings you had not obtained for me the grace of repentance. I am now in purgatory and I entreat you since you were able to save me, draw me out of this dreary prison. Still another said to her, I am in purgatory because of my infidelity for I would not correspond with God's call. For 12 years I held out against my vocation and was in the greatest peril of damnation. Because in order to stifle my conscience, I gave myself up to a life of sin. Thanks to the divine goodness which deigned to make use of your sufferings, I took courage to come back to God. And now, of your charity, get me out of this gloomy prison. Another said, who was just about to leave purgatory, offer the blood of Christ for us. What would become of us if no one were to help us? A priest said to her from purgatory, how great is the mercy of God when he deigns to make use of the sufferings of other souls to repair our infidelities. What a degree of glory I might have acquired had my life been different. And I corresponded with the graces God had given me. The names of these holy souls who were personally unknown to Sister Josepha, she carefully noted them down. The date and the place of their decease. And she verified them, and sure enough, they were all legit. Proved that these were real communications with souls in purgatory. Now, one of the reasons why the poor souls come to the mystics is that there's a deep kinship between them. That is to say, each and every holy soul in purgatory is now a mystic and a contemplative. I'm not just saying that to make you feel good about the souls in purgatory. It's very painful being a mystic and a contemplative. But how can this be? How can they be mystics and contemplatives? Well, because mystics, if you study the writings of mystical doctors like St. Teresa of Jesus, the Carmelite, Foundress and St. John of the Cross, you find out that mystics are those who seek God in themselves and they find Him. The great mystic St. Teresa of Jesus explained it in terms of a question. She says, Are we seeking ourselves in God or are we seeking God in ourselves? So, are you seeking yourself? in God or are you seeking God in yourself? There's a world of difference between these two things. Fallen man starts out his spiritual life seeking himself in God. That's selfish. What's he really seeking? Me. I'm looking for myself. But as he grows, he will start to seek God in himself, which is seeking God. At the point of her deeper conversion, if you know the life of St. Teresa of Jesus, 20 years she lived a lukewarm religious life. But at the point of her deeper conversion, St. Teresa said, Up till now, it has been my life that I've lived, but now God lives in me. She was shocked to find out how close he was. He's right here. St. Augustine, if you study his life, described how he sought God everywhere in order to find him until he finally looked inside. That can be a haunting experience looking inside because it may be empty. He may not be in there. Then you got to do something about it. It is very important to note that the transition in the life of St. Teresa of Jesus, it took place from seeking self in God to seeking God in self. That marked the time that Teresa became a mystic 
in a sincere and effective contemplative. So to find God, Teresa says to her nuns, all she needs to do is to be alone and to contemplate him in herself. Commenting on a line from St. John's Gospel, the line I'm speaking of here, the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. That's from the 15th chapter of St. John's Gospel. St. Thomas Aquinas, commenting on this line, notes that bad servants do not know what their master is doing. What things don't they know? St. Thomas says, strictly speaking, they do not know what God does in us. They do not know what God does in us. This is spoken by a mystic and it's spoken like a mystic. Someone who knew God from the inside. At first, this truth of looking and finding God inside our souls may sound us a little bit suspicious. I don't know about you, but when I first heard it, my alarm bell started to go off. Because today, let's face it, the devil has all his contemplatives. He's got his own contemplatives and there are a lot of them. We generally call them New Agers. But sadly, even Christians have adopted these diabolical methods of contemplation. And these are basically various kinds of methods seeking self in God through ourselves. They use various kinds of religion for self-realization, self-fulfillment. In other words, they're seeking self in religion. Man takes this path because he's trying to satisfy his nature. And our nature is religious. We cannot escape it. We are religious beings. It's how it is. Yet it is only with baptism that God comes to dwell in the soul by grace. If you recall, St. Joan of Arc, when she was on trial, she was asked if she were in a state of grace. And she fittingly replied, If I am, may God keep me there. If I am not, may He put me there. We are put into a state of grace through baptism and later by way of confession when, God forbid, our baptismal robe has been lost. So with baptism, God comes and dwells inside of us. And only after some time of struggle and passing through many purifications and trials, it's often called the purgative way for that reason, you're being purged. Then by the grace of God does the faithful servant of Christ begin to detach, to pull away from all things of this world, to seek God alone, to seek God for who He is. Goodness itself, love itself, truth itself. Instead of seeking consolations from God, which is the same as seeking self in God. I love you, God, for what you do for me. Give me some more sugar. It is in this way that the soul begins to seek God in the interior of his own self by passing through a purgative life. Note, by the way, that when the New Agers try to do this, try to seek God in themselves, they follow the path of the devil which is to mistake themselves for God, making themselves a sort of God, or to somehow tap into the energy force of the universe. And they see it, it's inside me. All I got to do is tap into it. That's New Age. And that's why when I first heard about this, I was like suspicious. Whoa, I don't know about that seeking God in yourself. Unfortunately, when living in this world, our body and all things material often distract us from seeking and finding God on the inside. This is why we have cloisters. This is why we have monasteries. This is why saints in the past have fled to some desert 
at least for a time, to find silence and solitude. They were seeking God where he could be found, inside. And if he wasn't there, they quickly went and put him there. Through baptism, through confession. Now, back to purgatory. Once we die in a state of grace, we will most assuredly find Him. God. Truth. Love. Nothing will prohibit us from seeing Him in our own souls. Not face to face, but we will see Him because we will be in a state of grace. We will see Him through faith. Our intellects will be perfectly rectified. There will be no error left. We will know Him, and that makes all souls and purgatories mystics. They know God as mystics do, through themselves and in themselves. They know what God does in them, as St. Thomas said. According to the teaching of the angelic doctor, the souls in purgatory know God by some sort of vision through their own essence that's through their own souls. Similar to how the angels know God. In other words, they'll have perfect recollection. They'll never not think and look upon God. The separated souls in purgatory, seeing their own supernaturalized souls, behold themselves in a state of grace and charity. In other words, they are very much aware of their own participation in the divine nature. Their knowledge of God is therefore the intuitive sense of the divine presence in their souls, which is the definition of mystical contemplation, which is called Mystical from its effects of infused knowledge by St. Teresa of Jesus. So they become mystics using all the writings of the mystics. It fits. But the will, hmm, our wills in purgatory, the wills of the holy souls remain attached to many things making purgatory essentially the mystical purification of the will from adherence to the finite. Thus, must all who are saved tread the mystical way to union. There's a few that do it while they're on earth. And there are many who do it hereafter. There is this to observe about the mystic state, that it is a state of suffering and joy both so intense as to anticipate if it were if we may reverently conjecture the condition of purgatory if you read the lives of the mystics they go through these intense moments caused by this mystical infusion of knowledge and their lower nature rebelling against it Very intense and anticipates the condition of purgatory. The mystic has his purgatory here, in other words. And once again, few souls are brave enough to endure it. So again, all the souls in heaven are mystics, contemplatives. They look upon God face to face. We either do it all now in this life or later in purgatory. Not surprisingly, the saints recognized one of the biggest hindrances to contemplative life was the body and all its needs. And this is why they practiced so much mortification. This is why they went into the desert. This is why they fasted. This body was always getting in the way of their knowing and loving God in themselves. My goodness, what would they say of our time with TV movies, and all sorts of stuff to distract us from seeing God where He can be found. Let us then strive to seek God inside as the souls in purgatory do by embracing our baptismal vows. 
And if we look inside and can't find God, let's run to confession and put Him there. Let us become mystics now to cease being servants and become friends so that the saying of St. Paul may be fulfilled in us that God would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened by His Spirit with might unto the inward man that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and the height, and the depth To know also the charity of Christ, which surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled unto all the fullness of God, such that we can say these words with St. Paul, And I live now not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.